I've actually for quite some while used uh, the next person that I'm going to introduce now, papers for my teaching, for my discussion with my research peers, uh, even in my papers, um, because he had you know, very many much similarities to the kind of work that I'm doing in the e-learning. But not only because of that, because especially he also had uh, a focus on research methodologies, on, on sort of improving the philosophy of science, particularly the design science and uh, DPR, design-based research and education. And so I would like to introduce to you Professor Chris Dieter from uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, who's going to talk to us today about the first primary, uh, uh, what do you call, the first keynote for the CELL conference. Thank you, and please give a hand to uh, Chris Dieter. Well, thank you for coming today. And I'm really happy to have the chance to share ideas. As I thought about what title to give my talk, <clears throat> I was reminded by the fact that during my career, many times I've seen the field put old wine in new bottles. So we get a new device or a new app, but we use it to do the same old stuff. And I thought it would be fun to talk about some new wine that is becoming possible but new wine that doesn't need a bottle anymore. So that's where the title comes from. But I don't want to begin by talking about technology, because when we begin with technology, we have a solution looking for a problem, and that's never a good thing. So instead, I want to talk about a report that came out in the US a couple years ago that parallels a lot of reports that have appeared around the world about preparing students for the 21st century. And what the reports say is that a really good education 20 years ago is now an inadequate education because countries are moving towards a shared global knowledge-based innovation-centered economy instead of the agricultural and industrial economies that we've had predominate in the past. Now, one thing that's interesting about this report is that it divides the knowledge and skills that students need into three buckets. Cognitive, which of course we think about a lot. Intrapersonal, which is things like having a work ethic or an appreciation of diversity. And the interpersonal, which is things like collaboration or leadership or conflict resolution. And the reason that they did this is there's a lot of research now that shows that in any country, a decade after you graduate, how well you're doing in life depends at least as much on your intrapersonal and interpersonal characteristics as it does on your knowledge and skills. We all kind of know this. I'm uh, notorious at Harvard because I once asked my dean, if it was possible to put the term low maintenance into a job description for a faculty member. Uh, it turns out that's illegal. But we all kind of know what that means because we all work with people who may be very intelligent and knowledgeable, but they're actually liabilities to the organization because of they don't have the intrapersonal and interpersonal skills that really are vital in the 21st century when so much of work is done by teams that are tackling really big problems rather than individuals working on small problems. And from the report, I pulled out a matrix of these three sets of skills arranged in columns. You'll have access to the slides. There's no need to try to quickly write this stuff down. And the report itself is available as a PDF for free online. And it's interesting to look at that matrix and ask ourselves in our teaching, no matter what level we're teaching at, which cells get a lot of attention and which cells get almost no attention. Because typically, at any level of education, that pattern is very uneven. And then if we go further and we ask ourselves, for our assessments, what are we assessing? And for our accountability systems, what are we held accountable for, that unevenness 
becomes even more apparent, some cells getting almost all the attention, other cells almost none, and yet we know that when our students leave the system as a whole, we want them to have everything. They, we want them to have the whole footprint. So this is a really interesting challenge, much more complicated than education has faced in the past. How do we give students all of these things? And we have as designers three contexts now within which we can work to try to accomplish this. One context is the familiar context of the classroom. Almost all of our efforts go into making that better. But there's another context which is the real world. And so in our programs at the graduate level at Harvard, we work hard to give our students internships and apprenticeships of different kinds that teach them things that they can't learn in classroom settings and that actually speak to many of the things on this matrix. But of course, we're fortunate in being able to do that because we have full-time students and Boston is a place with a lot of resources for real-world learning. That isn't the case everywhere. Nor is it the case when we look pre-college that students can easily leave the classroom setting, go out into the real world, and have some kind of rich mentoring experience. So there are big challenges that we have to face with the second context. Now, 10 years ago, I would have stopped here and I would have said we have these two contexts and we have to work within them. But what's so interesting about today is that we now have a third set of contexts. And those are our contexts that are digital contexts. So many of us are now spending time in a place that isn't a physical place. It's a psychological place, it's a social place, maybe it's a game, maybe it's an online discussion, maybe it's a Twitter chat, maybe it's Facebook. Uh, Ricky and, her, and Karen and, and many of the colleagues here are studying the different kinds of attributes of these places, and I find their work fascinating and important. Many of your presentations are about what's possible in these kinds of places that aren't physical, but are still very important. So when I think about how do we get to those skills on the three levels, I think about how do we divide our activities across these three kinds of contexts, because I cannot imagine anyone only in the classroom setting, being able to accomplish that task. And in fact, I can't imagine doing it with, with less than all three. And it's interesting to note that all three of these can be face-to-face -face only. They can be virtual only. But, of course, what we're finding is that where possible, it's terrific if they're blended or hybrid, because then you get the power of both the digital and the face-to-face. So, this is a multi-dimensional design challenge. Now, some of you may remember a book that came out in the 1970s uh, that was about uh, Gurdjieff, a mathematician, Escher, an artist, and Bach, a musician. And the book argued that they all had actually been doing the same thing. The author of the book carved some wooden objects that you can see at the center of the book cover. And the interesting thing about those wooden objects is that when you shine a light through them from different directions, you see the different letters, G-E-B. So he was trying to design something that captured this thing that was at the center of all of their work that had these different dimensions to it. And when I design, I try to think about the things in the center. I'm somehow trying to design something that has this cognitive, this intrapersonal, and this interpersonal dimension all woven together into multidimensional learning. But that isn't typically what we're doing. And I'm going to use an analogy throughout the talk, an analogy to the movies. You may know that in the very early days of the movies, People thought that the movie camera was a great way of going to scale. So now we're really excited about technology because it lets us 
go to scale with learning, learning in school and learning out of school, learning with hundreds of thousands of people in some sort of a MOOC. Well, in the early days of the movie camera, that's what they thought about it, but what they did was film plays. So they would set up the movie camera in front of a stage and they would film a play and then they would go to scale because then all over the world you could go to a movie theater and you could see the play without going to see those particular actors at that particular theater. But we know that that wasn't a very good use of the movie camera. That was in fact old wine in new bottles because movies now are much more powerful than filming a play. And some of the reasons that they're more powerful I'm going to use as metaphors in this talk. So I'm going to talk about how some of the digital environments now have some of the same characteristics that made movies powerful and moving beyond filming a play in the way that a lot of the old wine that we do is filming a classroom. So we'll do distance learning where we give people readings and we show videos of people lecturing. That's filming the play. It's not a bad thing to do, but it is a bad thing to do if it's the only thing that we do. So to continue with this, I want to describe some of the work that my colleagues and I do that's particularly oriented to the second context, the real world context, because that one is the most problematic in terms of how we get to there for many students. Many students are part-time, many students are pre-college, and so how do we provide richly mentored experiences for them outside of classrooms that aren't just social experiences interacting with other people through social media? So for the last couple decades, I have studied a psychological phenomenon called immersion. We've all experienced immersion, which is feeling psychologically as if you're somewhere that your body isn't located. So you go to the movies, maybe you're watching The Hobbit, and after about five minutes, you're no longer aware that you're sitting in a movie theater surrounded by strangers. You're with Gandalf and Bilbo somewhere in Middleburg. And that's because of a big visual field and very high fidelity sound, really strong acting, a powerful plot. But it's actually a weak form of immersion because it's passive. You're just observing. Immersion's not new. You can get immersed reading a really good book. But again, it's a passive experience. And what my colleagues and I have studied is interactive kinds of immersion that are much more powerful because you're shaping the environment you're immersed in. And today I want to just share some of our work about two of these three ways of achieving digital immersion. The first is multi-user virtual environments, MOODS, which are the Alice in Wonderland interface where you go through the monitor window and become a digital person in a virtual world. And then the third is almost the opposite, ubiquitous computing, where you're in the real world, you're walking around in the real world, but if you remember a movie, The Terminator, the Terminator is a robot that walks around in the real world, but the robot has magic eyes, and it sees on top of the world an overlay that helps it to understand what's happening. That's the third interface, augmented reality. So, what we are doing with our immersive interfaces is what in the movies are known as special effects. And my movie references are all old movie references to try to pose a little interesting challenge for you. So let me just ask, does anybody recognize what movie this scene is from? I'll give you a hint. This is a movie about a psychiatric patient who is having a nervous breakdown and it was actually made the year that I was born. Not that long ago, from my perspective, of course. <laughs> Anybody got a guess? This is a movie called Spellbound, Alfred Hitchcock. 
And anybody know the artist that was used to create these special effects? Salvador Dali, that's right. Very famous artist was used to create. So this was beyond filming a play because they were using special effects to try to have the viewer experience the kind of chaos that the patient was experiencing. And of course today, special effects are even much more powerful and give us some very interesting kinds of experiences. So, what I'm going to describe that uses special effects is something that we've been working on for about six years called the Eco Move. Uh, this is a middle school science curriculum in which you can be a student in a middle school in the middle of, a, of the winter, but you can be immersed psychologically at a pond in the middle of the summer interacting with the pond as an ecosystem scientist in a team with your friends to try to sort out what's going wrong. So this is new wine of a kind that hasn't been possible before. To give you a feel for what it's like, I'm going to show you a brief video of that. And let me find the right place where that video is. It is buried. Down here. So this is a look at the Eco Move. Eco Move is an exciting new curriculum research project at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. They use immersive virtual environments to teach middle school students about ecosystems. So you can think of this as a bit like a flight simulator if you're learning to fly an airplane, where the students are in a classroom, but psychologically they are in uh, an ecosystem, serving as ecosystem scientists, working together, having a kind of apprenticeship. And over a period of time, we've developed and studied this in different kinds of classroom settings to understand what students learn from this kind of experience. And it's very different than what a teacher can teach in a classroom without this kind of technology, because it's rather like a real-world internship, not quite as powerful, but certainly something that opens up a lot of possibilities. Each of the students in the team has a role that has about a quarter of the skills of an ecosystem scientist, and by rotating roles, they learn the whole skill set. So, where's the special effect? Well, one special effect is that you're traveling from the classroom into this simulated world. But we're also manipulating space in different ways, as you saw, shrinking things down, blowing things up so that you get a chance to look at them. I don't know if any of you recognize the, this movie, which is an example of the manipulation of space. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is about, again, a patient who is, um, in this case, schizophrenic. And the whole sets of the movie are designed to show you what life might be like through the eyes of a schizophrenic. I won't ask you which movie this is because it says on it, but some of you may have seen Groundhog Day where someone repeats the same day over and over and over again. And again, what we're manipulating in our simulation is time. So students can go back and forth in time and see changes and understand them and try to figure out the causality that's going on in the ecosystem. So, this is one kind of special effect that's becoming possible that lets us take an environment that's been walled away from the world and have it simulate different parts of the world. But it's still very limited. And when I would go to conferences of ecosystem scientists to talk about EcoLoop, they would get mad. About two minutes in, they would be angry and they'd say, Chris, our motto is no child left indoors. Mm -hmm. And now here you have something where kids never need to go outside again because they can have simulated outside. Well, of course, that wasn't our purpose. But I'm happy that now we're doing something that helps with that. And to accomplish it, we're using a very powerful infrastructure that's available throughout the world, and that is mobile devices. Some of you may remember the first powerful handheld device for learning. 
the Little Professor Calculator from Texas Instruments 38 years ago. One of the great tragedies of my life is I now look like the Little Professor. <laughs> I really never thought I would get this old. <laughs> and of course our modern devices, 38 years later, have far more power on every dimension than the Little Professor does. My colleagues in the hardware industry tell me that in the next 10 years, we'll gain as much power again as we did in the last 40. And so even kids in developing countries in poverty are going to have access to the equivalent of today's supercomputers that can be carried around through the world as phones and tablets. And we need to understand what we can do with all that power. So, the movie metaphor that comes to mind is shooting on a location. And um, this scene is from Lawrence of Arabia. And, of course, the big message of the movie is the immensity of the desert and how the desert dwarfs all the people in it. So, shooting on location is something very powerful that movies can do to get beyond the limitations of a play. Well, we also shoot on location in our augmented reality. Remember, this is like the robot with the magic eyes because we're using mobile devices to complement our simulated ecosystem by helping students have apprenticeships in real ecosystems. And to illustrate that again, so when you see the video, you're going to see Amy who is our ecosystem scientist that helps make sure that what we're designing is authentic. And you're going to see some kids experiencing EcoMobile. EcoMobile is a program we've been developing for middle school students uh, that helps them connect with their own learning and classroom with the real world experience. And part of what we're doing here, of course, is we're trying to get at all three of the buckets that I talked about earlier, not just the cognitive, but we're trying to create very rich situations in which students can master those other kinds of skills and receive mentoring on those skills. So augmented reality is very interesting because it contradicts something that educators have been telling people for thousands of years. For thousands of years we've been saying to people, you want to learn about the world? You got to get away from the world. The world is complicated. The world is noisy. The world is confusing. Come to the forum with Socrates. Come to the medieval campus at Harvard. Come to the industrial Europe classroom. And away from the world, we'll teach you about the world. And that's true up to a point. But now for the first time in history, we have this new why. And we can say to students, but when you're in the world, you're going to have a device with you that knows who you are, how you like to learn, where you are, what around you has been augmented for learning, who you like to learn with, and how to reach them. That's a really interesting vision. And we're finding in our research that the complement between the sort of simulator and then the, the augmented real world experience seems very powerful, more powerful than either one alone. But how do, we, how do we personalize this learning? Because we know that it isn't one size fits all. Every student has different needs, different passions, different strengths, different weaknesses, and somehow in group settings in education, we have to find ways to personalize so that whether they're learning alone or learning with a group of people, each student is getting what they need. And I find uh, reports like this on personalized learning, I was part of that conference in 2010, I was part of a more recent conference in 2014 that will produce a report shortly. We're developing tools that let us help personalize learning. Now, in movies, this is the equivalent of point of view. And in Spellbound, Alfred Hitchcock did something for the very first time that now is more commonplace in movies. 
He showed you things from the point of view of the actor. So this is actually the villain in Spellbound getting ready to shoot himself and to see him turn the gun and point it at his own face. As teachers, we need to be able to adopt the student's point of view in order to personalize. We need to see the world through their eyes in order to personalize. And these new media are potentially very powerful for doing that. So in our ego move and the other virtual worlds that we build or that others build, you automatically get log files. Anything that lives on a server automatically gives you log files that are timestamped. So we know second by second in the eco move what each student is doing, where they go, what, who they talk to, what data they collect or don't collect, what they share with their colleagues, what hints they access. Now, if you're a teacher doing project-based learning, you know that with a large group of students, every single one of them is in a different place. And it's very difficult to figure out what each one needs. You have too little information. We have the opposite. We have too much information. Big data. We have intellectually indigestible amounts of information about second-by-second -second behaviors that we have to somehow filter and aggregate and cluster and use smart people like teachers to understand so that we can sort out what these patterns of behavior mean in terms of what students know and don't know. And we also get that data in a little different form from things like augmented realities. Not only does the mobile device store where students are and what they're interacting with and what data they're collecting, but some of you may know about GoPro cameras and similar things that you can strap to your head. There's something that people that are into extreme sports like to use to document what they're doing. We're finding that GoPro cameras are a terrific research tool for capturing very rich video and audio data about what students are experiencing. Now again, it's not easy to understand how to interpret all of this, but potentially in the long run, this opens up much more powerful forms of assessment. We think after students do EcoMove and EcoMobile, we know a lot about what they do and don't know about science inquiry, not just from their outcome measures, like how well they produce that concept map and how well they do in explaining to someone what they think is going on, but from all the process data. If we have more data, if more of the curriculum collected this kind of material, whether it was from virtual worlds and augmented realities or from other kinds of digital media that live on servers, we think we could start to know what they do and don't know about collaboration, what they do and don't know about leadership, about their self-image of themselves, how much do they think they could be a scientist, about their metacognition, how reflective are they about thinking about their thinking and making strategic decisions about what to do next. And of course, we have to have that kind of data if we're going to effectively teach the full footprint to the 21st century. So I think a big and very exciting frontier, and again, I know many of you are thinking about this as well, is understanding how to combine these data streams and how to make enough of the curriculum take on a digital form so that we can start to do close-ups. This is from a movie called The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman. Next on Sidow is a knight who is playing chess with death. And the movie maker is very good at giving us a very rich close-up of Max that helps us understand a lot about the historical context. What we've done is to try to look for some low-hanging fruit in the kinds of data that we can harvest from these rich data files and then give students and teachers. So one of the things we can do in any virtual world is to harness path data. From an earlier virtual world, River City, we would give students their individual path data and their team path data, and we would compare that to the data that an expert might generate when they were exploring the world. 
Those of you who play games will recognize things like heat maps that show you not only where you've been, but how long you stayed there. And we gave students and teachers heat maps that showed where students who were doing well spent most of their time in green, or where students who weren't doing so well spent most of their time in pink. And what we found is that without a lot of explanation, just by providing these kinds of representations, students and teachers really became much better very quickly. Many of you are building things that have individualized guidance as part of it. River City, the curriculum that I mentioned, that was an earlier curriculum, had an individualized guidance system, and we kept track of which students accessed hints and how far down in the hint structure they went because that was very diagnostic for us about what they knew and didn't know. Some of you may be working with computerized agents. This is a computerized agent called Dr. C that actually wasn't in a virtual world, but easily could have been. We have agents in our worlds interact with students, and in the context of the story, in the narrative, they're asking students what they're doing, or they're asking for help from students. And we get diagnostic information that helps us know what students know and don't know. Uh, the eco-move, I, I cut that video in half, but there's also a digital forest ecosystem with predator-prey relationships. And so that can be a kind of transfer environment where we, they do one of the two ecosystems and then we look to see which skills they can transfer in a different environment. We also experimented with building some virtual performance assessments that were in full learning environments that had a similar flavor to them. So ultimately, I think that where we can go with this, and again, this is the new line, is to stop doing drive-by, summative, snapshot assessments that come too late to perform any useful function in helping students and teachers get better and instead focus on diagnostic assessments that are formative for teaching and learning that are embedded right into the learning situation of the kind that I've been mentioning, the kind that are based on process data. The metaphor that, that I use for this is inventory. I don't know if you remember when stores used to close for inventory, but I found that very frustrating. You're ready to buy something, you go to the store, there's this stupid sign on the door, sorry, closed your inventory, come back in three days. Very frustrating. You never see that anymore because of the barcode reader. Other than shoplifting, stores know second by second what their inventory is. We should be doing that in education. We shouldn't be closing for inventory to do summative tests. We should be measuring day by day the learning trajectory of students, much richer, much more accurate, and frankly, much more useful because now we can intervene while there's still a chance of changing something and help students and teachers to get better. This is perhaps the most difficult part of this whole vision that I'm presenting. It's not easy to understand how to interpret this complex process data. But I think in the long run, it may be the thing that makes the biggest difference. So, just as in movies, you end up knowing so much that you can do composition and editing. So we too can do composition and editing of these digital environments. Some of you may be doing what's known as AB experiments, where you have a large group, like a MOOC, and half the students get something done one way and half the students get something done the other way and you learn quickly what works best for whom and then you tailor it and tailor it and personalize it and personalize it and pretty soon everybody's getting a slightly different experience that's really tailored for them. I do want to say just a little bit about this third context the one that isn't physical, the one that is social, because I think it interacts quite richly, not just with the classroom, but with these different kinds of new media like the virtual worlds and the augmented realities. So even though social media are often used in relatively trivial ways, when we use them in our personal lives, they're powerful professionally for sharing 
thinking, and co-creating together. And something that I've thought a lot about is the intersection between two kinds of knowledge in social media. So let's contrast an encyclopedia like the Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia. Both of them are compendia of knowledge that actually look pretty similar in their end product. The Encyclopedia Britannica is top-down knowledge from experts like academics. Wikipedia is bottom-up knowledge from a rich community of people that are sharing their insights. So the epistemology of these two is completely different. And when they're combined, that can be powerful in a very interesting way. I want to illustrate this by reminding you about a recent news story that I think captures this intersection between bottom-up and top-down knowledge. Well, maybe it wasn't a news story. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that a newspaper like The Guardian, certainly a major, a form of print journalism, produced that advertisement. Maybe not surprising, though, because the financial model for print journalism has collapsed. And that's in large part due to the fact that people are getting a lot of their news bottom-up from social media rather than top-down from journalists. And, of course, there's a parallel in education that if we had more time, we could talk about in terms of top-down formal education versus bottom-up informal experience shared among people. But what The Guardian is making as a case, or at least how I'm interpreting this video, I don't know whether they actually had it in mind, is that you've got a very powerful fusion between the two because you've got top-down expert knowledge about things like asthma, and you've got bottom-up personal experience and moral perspective taking among the audience. And I think that's the rhetoric that we want to use for social media writ large. That social media become a way that we can take these rich simulated or augmented experiences and have communities comment on them infused with expert perspectives. And when students do that, they're also learning something that's similar to this idea of the three buckets of knowledge and skills. They're learning what people call new literacies. Now, literacy is a really strong term. It means fundamental, like reading and writing and mathematics. So it's not a small thing to say that there are new literacies. And yet, if we look at what's happening, with these digital tools, we do see new kinds of things that pervade the 21st century. So, for example, I did distributed cognition about six months ago when I did my income taxes because I used a digital tool that does two kinds of thinking I don't do well. It manipulates numbers accurately and as a tax preparation tool, it puts things on the right line of the federal form. But I did a kind of thinking the tool doesn't do, which is to make up creative excuses for the government about my taxes. And so the two of us were an effective intellectual partnership, distributed cognition. We see that all over the world now in many different flavors. I have a 14-year-old daughter. We adopted her from India when she was young. So I still have a child at home. She does transmedia navigation when she comes home to do her homework. Yes, she looks in the textbook and the encyclopedia, but she also looks in Wikipedia at different websites. She's doing Snapchat and other kinds of instant interaction with her friends. And together they're using judgment because they are making decisions about what to believe in an incredible hodgepodge of information that's inconsistent, incomplete, sometimes inaccurate, sometimes biased, but you have to sort out meaning from it. And of course, that's exactly what we're doing today as adults in the 21st century. I don't believe in all of the new literacies. After decades of faculty meetings, I no longer believe in collective intelligence, for example. <laughs> 
But maybe these are powerful enough media that even something like that will become possible. And so what I'm saying is that these three contexts, the classroom, the real world, whether it's direct or simulated, and this third context, this social context, all interact with one another, all can build on one another. So let me just try to sum this up. We face a huge challenge in preparing not just some students for the 21st century, but every person worldwide for the very difficult challenges we face in the 21st century where we will need every human being's full talents to overcome some of the huge problems that we're facing. We're wrestling with things like massive learning that give us ways of reaching all of those people who aren't going to have access to a school every three miles and a university every 30 miles. And so people are looking at things like MOOCs as one example of massive learning. And in a year ago, I co-convened a workshop on this for our National Science Foundation. And that too is available online for free, the report from that workshop, to talk about the opportunities for massive learning, but again, the mistakes that we're making along the way. Because the fact of the matter is that today's MOOCs look very much, usually, like filming a play. So we need to think about a different model of pedagogy, very different from what we have now. This is new wine. Experiences are the central thing rather than giving students predigested information. You're not learning abstractly on the blackboard. You're learning situated in a rich context, and you're learning as part of a community, but ultimately you want to own that information inside of yourself. It has to be personalized to you. And assessment isn't based so much on tests and papers. It's based on your accomplishments. It's based on your experiences, on the kinds of process data that come out. Something that's much more accurate, something that's much more interwoven. So what's the biggest barrier? It isn't the technology. The technology is coming along beautifully. It actually isn't the economics, because while there are economic challenges, if we're clever, we can save money by using the technology as ways of paying for the costs of the technology. The biggest problems with innovation, as they always are, are psychological, cultural, and political. So teachers teach as they're taught. If I want teachers to understand how to use a virtual world, they'd better be learning that in a virtual world. If I want them to understand how to be effective with students in Twitter chats, they'd better learn that doing Twitter together. You can't give a one-hour lecture on the importance of learning by doing without the medium contradicting the message. The important thing isn't the technology. The reason that all of the things that I'm describing seem to have power is because it's deeper content, more active forms of learning, more authentic forms of assessment, the links between school and life. If the technology is doing that, it's effective. If the technology isn't doing that, in my experience, it's not worth the trouble. And in the long run, while we can provide expertise and we can provide help, we are facing massive learning challenges, and in order to overcome that, we're going to have to learn to be much better at different kinds of peer learning. And so, the thing that I spend most of my time doing, ironically, isn't learning. It's unlearning. Like you, I spent decades as a student in a traditional educational system. And, like many of you, I spent further years teaching in conventional ways. So I have all of these almost unconscious beliefs and values and assumptions about what teaching and learning and schooling are like that now I have to unlearn. It's a little like with health. You may not know it to look at me, but decades ago I was very thin. And I ate anything that I wanted to, as much as I wanted to, and my wonderful metabolism burned it all up. 
And then something terrible happened. My body changed, but of course my eating habits didn't change. And now I struggle with constantly unlearning those old eating habits. And what we see when we look at people's struggles to be healthy is that that's not just an intellectual process. It's an emotional process. It's a social process. People are trying to unlearn something that's part of their identity. And so they need emotional and social support. And so we come together in conferences like this. We use social media. We find ways to help each other learn and unlearn. So I want to close with an optical illusion. This is a classic. You can see an old person. You can see a young person with her face turned away. But because of the way the brain works, you can't see both at once. When I talk to big publishers, about these kinds of visions. They get excited and they say, Chris, this is great. We're doing digital textbooks. And so instead of a static image in a print textbook, now there can be a little virtual world. And when students are doing their reading, they can muck around a little in the virtual world as a way of getting motivated. And you know, walking home, maybe the park will be an augmented reality. And so they can get a little motivation from the augmented reality from when they go home and do their homework problems. That's the old person. That's taking the cake of presentational assimilative instruction and sprinkling a little technology fairy dust on the top. It's not going to work. But with the same infrastructure, with the same people, we could have the young person. Her face is turned away. We don't fully understand her, but what if the cake is the experiential learning in the world, in the simulator, in the augmented reality, in the project-based learning, in the social media, and all the kinds of things that you're doing? And the frosting now is that expertise coming in, as with the three little pigs, just in time to help you when you're stuck, when you don't need to know what to do next, when in your personal journey, you need the next push in the right direction. It's not going to be easy to get to the young person, but in the next decade, that's the big challenge that we all face so that our movie can have a happy ending. Thank you very much.